Hello, and welcome to Patrick Replies, the show where I, Patrick, reply to comments and questions about the latest video, and today we are talking about the Looney Tunes video, which was a lot of fun to make because I just got to watch a lot of cartoons, although I also had to watch Space Jam 2, which was not fun. Anyway, we are making one little change to the structure in this episode. We are covering the comments from the YouTube comments section first, and then we are doing the questions from the Ask Patrick channel on Discord, because the comments section tends to pertain more to the actual video that we're here to talk about, while the questions uh, are just a free-for-all Q&A about anything. So I figure let's stay on topic first and then we can veer off into, I don't know, whatever people want to ask about. So, first up, The John White says, The song rules. Uh, I assume you're talking about the placeholder theme song that Brian wrote for our placeholder title sequence. Uh, we do have a new theme song and title sequence that are in the works. Uh, you know, they're hopefully coming soon, um, but since we kind of launched the new format of the show and we had a place where we needed a title sequence, um, we made a little placeholder one. I made the visual part in like 10 minutes and then Brian made a theme song and uh, I think, I believe he improvised the lyrics in one take. And, um, and as usual with Brian, he knocked it out of the park. It's a shame that I think that'll be the only episode it appears in. So enjoy it while it lasts. I mean, the video isn't going anywhere. You can watch it as many times as you want. Suspicious Squid Productions says, I think memes might be keeping Looney Tunes alive for younger generations. Big Chungus, that Tumblr post imagining Bugs Bunny uh, screwing with Thanos, Bugs Bunny queer icon tweets going viral every few months. Hopefully that stuff inspires kids to find them either on HBO Max or on YouTube uploads, since Zaslav just deleted all the 50s Looney Tunes from HBO Max. Uh, yes, you do bring up uh, a, a an unfortunate thing that I didn't get into in the video, which is that, you know, we're all aware of, uh, you know, David Zaslav, now the head of Warner Discovery, um, just uh, liking to delete stuff uh, from from streaming services and making things unavailable to watch anymore. And yeah, they recently took down, like, half of the original Looney Tunes shorts, specifically the stuff from, like, the the 50s and 60s, which is, like, the Golden Age stuff that most people want to watch. Uh, it sucks. But as far as memes go, yeah, I mean, Looney Tunes do really lend themselves to being made into memes. That's really the highest praise. It's like, like, like what greater honor is there than to to be become a meme? The thing that I wonder about is is will there come a point where kids only know Bugs Bunny is like, oh right, the the rabbit in the tuxedo from memes. Um, like, wouldn't it be funny and kind of depressing if people like didn't even know what his voice sounded like? They only know Bugs th uh, through memes. I don't know. I I I hope younger viewers are uh, you know looking up the sources and origins of those memes because those cartoons are good. I don't know how I feel about this. Moving on. William Miller says, Emma, notice me. Congratulations. You, clearly you were noticed. My favorite kiln that isn't Tombstone is Ghost in the Darkness. Ooh, that's not one you hear come up very often. Isn't Ghost in the Darkness, isn't that the, uh, the Val Kilmer, Michael Douglas movie that's kind of like Jaws, but with a tiger. I haven't actually seen it, but uh, you don't hear it come up very often. Anyway, hey Patrick and crew, great video, despite my instant instinct to defend Space Jam to the death. I think that's just like a natural millennial thing. This topic is tangential to a topic that has been floating around the back of my head for a while, namely the pattern of old media being resurrected in subsequent generations and taking on the form of popular media of the time and the effect that has on the story and structure of the work. Some examples beyond Looney Tunes would be Matrix Resurrections, meta and video game focused, 2012 Red Dawn, complete lack of gritty realism, 2017 The Mummy, attempt at realism over swashbuckling fun, and the two It movies that reworked the story to capitalize on 80s nostalgia. Have you noticed anything similar, and do you think there is a conversation to be had about taking older stories and squishing them into modern molds? You know, I do think there's a conversation to be had about that, and I actually made a video about that very thing in 2018, the video about 
uh, Robin Hood and King Arthur, and how basically about every decade, those two characters would get reimagined in movies, usually taking on the form of whatever was popular at the time. And so, yeah, for more of my thoughts on that, go check out that video. That was a fun one. Yeah, it has jokes about Nutcracker on the Four Realms, which is a great thing to make jokes about. Anyway, moving on. Lucas Padilla says, one of the head people at Disney during the Golden Age enviously said about the classic Warner Brothers shorts, quote, it was like admiring the kind of dame that you couldn't introduce to your mother. That is a great quote, and I wish I knew about that when I was writing the video, because that would have been good to include in the, uh, the brief history of Looney Tunes part. Okay, Charlie Safe says, years ago, you and... Oh, this is interesting, where even though this is the YouTube comment section, we're still getting a variety of uh, questions that are just kind of unrelated and just, just random. Um, Charlie Safe says, years ago, you and Jake made a video of you two writing a script for a horror movie in a weekend. What has happened with that script? So yeah, in a, we made this video in, I think, February 2017. It was, we, we made it the weekend that Get Out opened because it, at the beginning of the video, we go to see Get Out on opening night. And then, yeah, th then we wrote uh, the first draft of a script in three days. And then in 2018, we made a follow-up video where we wrote, over the course of a week, we wrote the second draft. We have not worked on it since then, because here's the situation. Uh, as much as, you know, making narrative films and directing movies and like writing screenplays and stuff like that, that is what I want to be doing full time. My day job is making these videos and running this channel. And the problem is that this is not like a regular day job where, you know, there's a set schedule and I have weekends off and uh, and then there's like, you know, once I clock out at the end of the day, there's time to then work on my other projects, <laughs> like my, you know, like, to, like to, to work on that script or my personal projects and stuff like that. Um, no, the videos, uh, because as you've probably seen, they are uh, complicated uh, and they take a lot of time to make. They are, I think, more complicated than they probably need to be. And so they just consume my whole life. So uh, I work on them seven days a week, uh, basically until I go to sleep every night, uh, leaving basically no time to work on those other projects. And when I do want to work on those other projects, it basically requires just taking time off from my day job and, uh, and you know, just not making money. To be clear, I'm doing well. I can afford to, you know, live by myself in Brooklyn. Uh, I have a job that, that, you know, many people would love to have. I'm, I'm in a, a fortunate situation. So yeah, I'm not complaining at all. But what I am saying is that if the videos made more money, if they were more profitable, um, it would be easier to maybe be like, I'm going to take a month off to like work on that script. But we're not really in that position. I can't really afford to take that much time off. And uh, I, got, I got to keep making the videos, and, um, and the videos are complicated, so there's not a lot of time to work on the other stuff. And it's tricky because I need to be able to do some of the other stuff, like make some short films and like write a script or whatever, uh, if I want to be able to get to the point where I'm doing that full time. So this is the great conundrum that I am constantly faced with. To be, to be fair, I am going to, uh, you know, make a short film uh, that will, you know, premiere on Nebula that Nebula is giving the, us the budget for. Um, and I am going to do that this year. Uh, just got to, again, carve out the time. So anyway, what is happening with the script Jake and I wrote? It needs another draft. And um, I don't know, hopefully at some point we can find, uh, you know, a way to, to take time off and make that happen. Anyway, moving on. Alice Wang says, Emma may be the most non-Gen Z, Gen Zer I know. I don't know too many Gen Z people, so I don't have a lot to compare Emma to. But yeah, please get her to, to watch more movies. There are a lot of famous movies that Emma has not seen. To be fair, there are a lot of famous movies that I have not seen, and I talk about movies for a living. Um, but I will say, uh, the movies that Emma has seen, Emma's areas of expertise, such as, you know, the, uh, the work of Val Kilmer, or the work of Tom Hardy, uh, Emma knows more about those movies than anyone you will ever meet. 
Uh, and like, like Emma could write books on those films or kilns. A few of us, like uh, like Siddhanth and I, are we're constantly making a point of like, especially in New York, when there are like like rep screenings of of great older movies. And by older movies, I mean just like any like not not brand new movies. Uh, we'll like buy tickets immediately and be like, Emma, you're coming to see this, like. You know, you have to see this movie, and we want you to see it on the big screen since you have this opportunity. Look, guys, Emma's, Emma's watching lots of movies. Uh, uh, she's doing great. The Movie Planet says, <laughs> Hey, okay. Man, lots of questions for Emma. Um, hey, Emma, you gave me a shout-out in the Ambulance Replies video, but didn't put my question up, so maybe you could select it this time? Thanks. Oh, okay, I remember this question. Uh, your aside about how you haven't seen the Danish original of Ambulance has me wondering, how often does enjoying a film you, uh, make you seek out prior films? Do you often seek out the originals after having watched remakes or re-adaptations? Did your love of RRR lead you to watch uh, some of S.S. Rajamali's earlier work, such as Magadira or R. Ega? Uh, or even other Indian blockbusters, do you go back and check out the Mission Impossible TV series, and so on. If I remember correctly, I think I actually did answer this question, but I gave such a boring answer. Like, I, I think I cut that part out because I was so boring. The basic answer is, uh, yeah, sometimes. Sometimes if I watch a movie by a director I'm not familiar with and I like it, I'm like, yeah, I'll watch some more of their movies. Like with Rajamali, I mean, I've watched the Bahubali movies, and I, I'm planning soon on on watching more of them like ega especially um but like i haven't seen the mission impossible tv series yeah i mean i mean i just don't really have a good answer uh yeah the answer is sometimes and regarding your comment on this video about disney not producing mickey content are you purposely forgetting the acclaim that seems a little bit rude or i'm sorry are you purposely forgetting the acclaimed series of mickey shorts that started in 2013 and are going on to this day. I wouldn't have phrased it like that. But uh, many people have asked about um, the, like, like have I seen those those Mickey cartoons, uh, the recent ones? And um, no, I was not purposely forgetting them. So here's why I didn't talk about th those Mickey shorts. First of all, the video is about Looney Tunes. The section on Mickey Mouse is pretty short. And I was mostly using Mickey as an example of showing how a character um, has kind of evolved to become more like brand symbol and brand mascot than character himself. Uh, and while those shorts do exist, and they are pretty good, uh, I watched some of them uh, while researching this, I don't think they are, e even today, like what Mickey is best known for. Uh, I, I, I feel like these shorts, I don't, I don't see them discussed very often. They don't seem to get a lot of media attention. Um, like they're there, but at least from what I've seen, they don't seem to have had a very big like pop cultural impact. I didn't think they really factored heavily into the conversation. The thing with those Mickey shorts is, I think they're kind of similar to the recent uh, Looney Tunes cartoons, uh, the shorts released over the past couple of years. Because, um, yes, they are good shorts that are very much in the style of, like, you know, more, like, classic-era uh, cartoon shorts, um, but that also are kind of, like, hidden on a streaming service, and a lot of people aren't aware of them. So, yeah, the video was not about Mickey Mouse, and um, I didn't think these really needed to be mentioned. K Shar 13, K Shar 13. Uh, sorry, again, if I mispronounce anyone's name. In the next Q&A video, can you please explain the story behind the camera move slash Emma's catch at 143 in this video? Are we talking about... Uh, that one. Okay. Did Dave ask you to uh, to submit this question? I think it was Dave's idea that he, he's like, oh, I should, oh, we knew we needed Emma to get the remote. And so Dave was like, what if I throw it to her uh, when I'm I'm walking out the door? And then uh, yeah, this part actually, like, th I think this part was mostly Dave's idea. Uh, Dave was the one throwing the remote to Emma uh, from off screen. And uh, we do have a lot of outtakes of Emma missing the catch. The goal was to have her not look at it, to just like kind of like catch it like very casually. Um, and then the camera move here, uh, we shot, we, we did like kind of a static wide of just the two of us. And then on this, I think, 
I think this was the third to last take that we used. Um, Dave operated the camera and he, he was like, hey, uh, what if I moved around a little bit with it? Um, and, uh, and it worked well. And that was basically it. So yeah. Uh, so shout out to Dave Wiskus, um, who, uh, you know, who's a good collaborator and um, did some good remote throwing and some good camera operating in the scene. Lucy S. says, I mean, if the issue is format, the most rapidly growing current media format is short slash TikTok slash reels. I felt that the video is going toward imagining how the Looney Tunes format could be the perfect fit for the newest medium. Did this route come up at all as you were writing the video? If not, would it be viable? What are the pros and cons? So this is something that, that, that multiple people brought up. Like, why not make new Looney Tunes shorts for, like, YouTube and TikTok and stuff like that? It could work. It could work. Here's my thinking about it. Back up until maybe, like, 20... Honestly, maybe up up through like 2015 at, at the latest, I'd say, you would see more of studios and production companies like investing in high production value, like web series and original stuff and, and, and sh comedy shorts and stuff like that made for the internet, uh, released on YouTube. And then things kind of trended away from that. And these platforms, YouTube, TikTok, whatever, are really entirely dominated by you know, what, what, what they would call user-generated content, uh, as in stuff made by, like, independent people, uh, you know, not stuff made by, like, the major studios. I feel like this is part of why, like, uh, the, the, the big, you know, expensive YouTube Red and YouTube Premium shows, like, the, like the YouTube originals, um, didn't really do so well, and, and that kind of failed, uh, is that people just weren't as interested in seeing, like, that kind of TV slickness on YouTube. Um, they wanted things to feel like they were just like made by regular people, not by like the corporation. And and so I think there is that slight bias against like, you know, like the major studios like officially releasing stuff. Like YouTube or TikTok or whatever are the places for like the regular people, even if the regular people are like famous and rich and successful, they're still, like, regular people making it themselves. They're not, like, the giant corporations making this stuff and giving it to us. And so I think there's a slight bias against that. And so part of me wonders, like, would there be excitement about it if if suddenly they were, like, coming out on, on TikTok? There's also just the thing of, uh, like, there's not that much money to be made from them. And so for, like, Warner Brothers, I don't know if it would be worth the investment of uh, of of commissioning all these new cartoons um, and just releasing them on these platforms where, you know, there isn't that much money to be made unless you're doing like sponsor deals, which wouldn't even make sense in those videos. Uh, yeah, I don't think we want to see like a, a Looney Tunes short with like product placement for Toyota, uh, <laughs> and that's how they got it funded. Um, and so like financially for Warner Brothers, I don't know if it makes sense. And I don't know if the, if the audience would be really into it. Like, it's one thing for the audience to, to just, like, repost and share clips from existing cartoons, but for, like, officially releasing new ones there, I don't know if it would really make, like, business sense. But, I mean, right now, Warner Brothers has put a bunch of classic Looney Tunes shorts on YouTube. So, they're there. Joshua Howell says, I love the title sequence. Well done, Brian. I agree. Well done, Brian. Uh, next up, Jeremy Adler says, great video. Thank you. Um, I actually think the comparison to Muppets is an apt one. Like Looney Tunes, the Muppets have some great pieces of media out there. Like Looney Tunes, they had a bit of a resurgence in the 2000s. Now both of them seem to struggle to get any relevancy again. Sure, Muppets have had some things here or there, like Muppets Haunted Mansion and Muppets Now, but there's been nothing since. I guess my question is, do you think that these two are equivalent to each other, and is there a future for the Muppets? And will this get answered later this year for your Muppet video? Keep up the great videos. I will obviously talk more about this in the video about 
you know, Muppet movies and Muppet cinema coming out later this year. I think Muppets are easier to do stuff with than the Looney Tunes because they're just more dynamic characters. They were the stars of, of a, a long-running successful TV show. They have many feature films. The Muppets can do, like, emotional scenes. They can have character arcs. They can do all these stuff that the Looney Tunes are not made to do. They're a group of friends. They all interact. They have relationships. So yeah, because the Muppets just work better in the kind of formats like TV shows and movies that the Looney Tunes are harder, uh, you know, to fit into, um, I think I think they're going to have an easier time surviving. I think at some point, you know, someone's going to crack the right concept for a new Muppet show, or they'll do it a new Muppet movie, and um, and yeah, I'm I'm not worried about the Muppets. I just would like more good Muppet stuff soon. D Leeds 95 says, Emma is on the cast now. Woo! Finally, some respect for the Wilms versus foremost lock fluencer. It is true. Uh, I think Emma is probably like the world's number one lock fluencer, and we are all very happy that Emma is on the show. Uh, you know, we, we love Emma here. Uh, uh, we love writing for her. Um, and the audience seems to seems to be on board, which is great. Ryan Lee says, since the video didn't mention them, what are your thoughts on the Wabbit slash new Looney Tunes cartoons made for Cartoon Network and Boomerang in the mid-2010s? In the video, I did not mention the 2015 Looney Tunes uh, cartoon that was... It had like three different names, like depending on what country it was released in. Like in some places it was Wabbit. I think on HBO Max, it's it's listed under New Looney Tunes. So the thing about these videos is they are usually not intended to be like comprehensive histories, uh, where I list every single thing that, that, that happened ever throughout all time. Again, there was a section about history in this video, and it was called a brief history. The point is usually to cover some main argument, express some main idea or thesis. And so when doing all the research and combing through everything, uh, what I'm trying to do is figure out like, okay, what is the narrative through this? Like, like how do I, like, like what are the, the core pieces of evidence that I have to like put forth to you know, to, to express this idea, to cover the arguments, to find like, okay, like where's the start and where's this going to end? And I figured out that I wanted this, this thing to like, to conclude and culminate with discussing the recent like 2020 HBO Max Looney Tunes cartoons. And so when I'm going through all the stuff from the 2000s, when I got to the 2015 cartoon, uh, which I, I did watch some of, and I think it's okay, um, the thing about that is it is closer, it is definitely a step toward the most recent cartoons. It's more in line with the, the classic era, like just like, like wacky shorts. It just has a more like mid 2000s Cartoon Network visual style, which, um, you know, it, it's like, it, it's like fine. It's like, I, I, I think the show is like pretty solid. So yeah, I decided to skip over it because I didn't think there was really that much to say about it beyond, and then they made another show and it was uh, a bit closer to, to where we eventually ended up, but, um, but it was just okay. So yeah, I just didn't have that much to say about it. Uh, I didn't think it really added a whole lot to the conversation. Also, I think it's some of the celebrity cameos in that show are weird. Like Snoop Dogg's in it. And I, I, I don't know. I don't think we needed a Looney Tunes show where uh, Snoop Dogg shows up for an episode. It just feels weird. Anyway. Popemon says, slight correction or perhaps better put, a slight nuance for 2640. Six Flags actually has, or at least had, a core theme. The original park was designed around the celebration of the six nations who have flown flags over the years and the history of Texas at those times. To this day, when you go to the park in Arlington, you can still see the division of certain areas uh, as being different countries, and some of the rides and attractions have maintained the theming. For instance, the Texas region still has live reenactments of gunslingers fighting and various historical or historically inspired characters in the summer. When WB bought the parks, 
They started to strip the theming out of them and shoehorn the Looney Tunes as park mascots, but this has always been a weird shotgun marriage. It's easier to the non-Texan parks that have little to no connection with the park history, but it really has transformed the original park into a monstrosity almost unrecognizable from what it was, especially back in the early days of the 60s. I mean, yeah, this is kind of what we got into a bit in the video, although I, I obviously didn't cover like the, the history of Six Flags, but it's the thing where you look at the Disney parks and they are just so directly connected to and an extension of the Disney movies and cartoons and those characters. It's all part of the same thing. And then you have Six Flags where it's some other theme park that they grafted Warner Brothers stuff onto. And so there is no like coherent theme. It's not just a Warner Brothers park. It's a theme park that existed that they just like throw the Looney Tunes into. Disney has always been really, really good at this thing of like building this this meaningful experience where like you go to, to Disney World and it's not just like, oh, a fun day at that theme park. It's like, like it means something to people. And, uh, and, you know, many other studios and media corporations have tried to imitate Disney and, and copy their success over, over the past like 100 years and it's hard to do. And, um... Warner Brothers clearly wanted to uh, to make Six Flags, you know, their their Disney World, and um, it doesn't really work that way. Calvatron, Lord of Nothing, says the Looney Tunes show had a zany energy to it. I think you downplay a little bit here. Yes, to put them in this grounded environment, but a good few of the episodes take big, insane swings. Uh, yes, multiple people did point this out that I did I did make. The Looney Tunes show, the 2011 like sitcom version of Looney Tunes, to be more, I guess, grounded and boring than it actually was. Yes, the show could get very zany, but I still think that it like it was less zany than like Tiny Tunes was or Animaniacs was. My thing with the Looney Tunes show is I think it would have been a perfectly solid 2010s Cartoon Network show. Uh, with other characters, I still just think it's like a little bit too domestic and grounded for the Looney Tunes, and I think it's a weird fit for those characters. So even as zany as it was, I think it was holding them back from their true selves. Yes Man says, My favorite BTS anecdote for Space Jam is that when the credited VFX supervisor was brought on board, they'd already shot the green screen sequences with Michael Jordan, in which the tunes were played by actors in green suits so that MJ had something to play off of. The only problem is that the director had zero understanding of how green screens work and regularly had the actors in their green suits walk in front of MJ and then instructed the VFX supervisor to remove the green screen man and replace him with the tune. Sounds like a nightmare. Uh, it really does. Also, you know, you'd think from making the uh, like the the hair Jordan commercials that Joe Pitka would be familiar with how this stuff worked. Anyway, this will never happen. But I would love like a really in depth warts and all documentary just just about Space Jam, uh, like from you know the development of it to the production of it. It's it's just it's weird. A weird movie. All right, and that is it for the YouTube comments section. We are now moving over to the questions from Discord. Um, in case you're new here, uh, our Discord server, which is exclusively for members of the Patreon, you know, join the Patreon, you can join the Discord server. Um, we have an Ask Patrick channel where you can submit questions for these videos that can be about anything. And I'm gonna cover those now. Eldritch Absurdist says, what are your favorite comic book shops uh, in and around New York City. I'm visiting for the first time in a few months and I'm looking for recommendations. I don't want to disappoint you, but New York is not some mecca of like these amazing, like like elaborate comic book stores. Most of the comic book stores here are, you know, pretty ordinary comic book stores. I go to a store uh, called Anyone Comics in Brooklyn, which is a lovely store, has a great staff, uh, really cool people. You know, I go there every week chat with the employees. It's always a nice time. If you're in Brooklyn, everyone go to Anyone Comics. Great store. But uh, I feel like if you're visiting New York, I mean, Midtown Comics is the big one. They have multiple locations in the city. Uh, the Times Square one, the one on 40th Street between Broadway and 8th Ave, that is, uh, I mean, that's like the biggest comic store in the city. They have two floors. 
They got everything. Uh, that's the one that might be cool to see. I will say, San Francisco is a weirdly great city for comic book shops. Cue ball. Uh, ages ago, you said that after seeing Spielberg's West Side Story, you said you wish he would only make musicals for the rest of his career. What musical would you want to see him tackle? I mean, I still want Spielberg to do more musicals. Stage musicals are kind of a blind spot for me. I just... Uh, you know, I feel guilty about this, especially living in New York, but I do not see enough Broadway shows. Uh, and so musicals that have n not been made into movies, I am not an expert on. Do not come to, to ask me about Stephen Sondheim. That is, you know, <laughs> a kind of a blind spot, but I, you know, I, I, I gotta fix at some point. So I can't answer this with, like, stage musicals that haven't been turned into movies yet. But as far as musicals that are already movies that, uh, he could, like do a new version of, like he did with West Side Story, um, I bet Spielberg would be great with Oklahoma, which is a classic, uh, which is a, a a pretty good movie that I think he could make into a great movie. And also, it's, you've got the big scenic vistas, the great locations. It's like kind of a Western. There's a dream ballet. I think he would make that all amazing. And also Brigadoon, which is also a pretty good movie. Uh, that is set in an incredible location that I think Spielberg would crush. So there are my answers. Sebas Castell says, Hey Patrick, who's your favorite Looney Tune character? Um, when I was a kid, it was Bugs Bunny. Very unoriginal. But I think, as I've gotten older, I think it's Daffy Duck. Um, although, I find Elmer Fudd to be the funniest. He just has a great voice. Mortimer Menander says, Patrick, when can we expect the next TCM Wine Club video? You know, the TCM Wine Club video was a lot of fun to make. And, you know, it would probably be fun to make another one. Ooh, okay, long question from Nova X 81 um, Hi, Patrick. Loved your Looney Tunes video and actually had a curious follow-up question after watching it. Early in the video, you mentioned how Looney Tunes in the early days were often very different from Disney's core cartoons. Zany, Looney, a little rough around the edges compared to Mickey's cleaner, family-focused cartoons. I'm a parent of a couple small kids, and in the past few years, it has begun to feel like the new Mickey cartoons they're producing, uh, particularly The Wonderful World of Mickey Mouse, are taking direct inspiration from the old Looney Tunes shorts. They often have a lot more of the physical comedy antics and well-choreographed visual jokes that sync with, with its more classical, often orchestral score. This has definitely made them feel a bit more timeless already, with the comedy working for both kids and adults in many cases. More importantly, perhaps, they generally range from about three to eight minutes long, right in that short form length Looney Tunes used to use. If you've seen any of these, I'd be interested in your opinions on the similarities and perhaps on this flip as a whole with Looney Tunes cast now sadly relegated to background iconography while Mickey and Pals seem to be redefining themselves for a new generation of kids. So yeah, I, I covered this a bit earlier. Uh, the new, uh, the newer Mickey cartoons that are on Disney Plus. I wasn't aware of these Mickey cartoons until I started researching the video, and I watched some for this. And um, I mean, like I said earlier, I, I think it's a similar situation to the recent Looney Tunes cartoons. In both of these cases, they are making good new cartoons for these characters, new shorts, very much the classic format, and they're putting them on these streaming services. And um, But it's also just a thing where I feel like in a lot of ways they're not getting the attention they deserve because they are just these uh, cartoon shorts that are hidden away on these streaming services that are just so full of other stuff. And yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm really curious how well known uh, these these Mickey cartoons are because um, like I wasn't aware of them until recently and I never see anyone talk about them. I wonder you know how many kids are watching them. I don't know. I'm curious. Jacob from Holland, the great Jacob from Holland, who I always hear mentioned at the end of episodes of the Light the Fuse podcast. Hi Patrick, my name is Jacob and I live in Holland. I am new to this platform, so I hope you will see this message in time when you make a new Patrick Applause video. Clearly, we did. Um, I wanted to thank you for making the two recent videos about how to analyze movies and the Looney Tunes video. Both of them were so great. I learned a lot from them. 
Uh, thank you so much. I'm, I'm glad you enjoyed them. I personally love to write my own meaningless opinions about films on Letterboxd. My two-part question for you is, do you read other people's reviews on Letterboxd, and is there any possibility you could follow me on the app? That would mean the world to me, but I absolutely understand if you don't do it as well. Thank you so kindly for reading this message, Patrick and Emma. Best, Jacob from Holland. So, as far as Letterboxd goes, um, my general policy on there is I only follow a small handful of people, and it's just people that I know in real life, just, like, friends of mine. And that's, that, that's, that's really it. And so, like, no offense to anyone else, uh, but I just, I, I like keeping it to just a small, manageable group of friends. Um, and, but yeah, and I, I don't really regularly read other people's reviews on there, unless it's just my friends' reviews. Uh, I don't spend a ton of time on Letterboxd. I post my dumb nonsense uh, reviews that I don't put a lot of thought into. Um... And then I see what my friends watched, and that's really all I use it for. So there you go. Pinball Witch says, great video about Looney Tunes. Woo, thank you. Patrick is fun and engaging as always. Dave the Agent is always fun. Emma was a hoot, and I giggled so hard at Brian's song. The essay got me wondering about other franchises that were big through cultural inertia that might not have survived a revolution in how we consume media. Radio dramas that never made it to TV, for example. Not really a question, just a thought, and wanted to let you all, uh, you all know how much I enjoyed your work. Thank you so much. Um, waiting for hashtag Jakestis. Ooh, Jakestis. That should catch on. I'm not sure I'd even call these franchises, but I, I feel like just a lot of cartoons from like the 60s and 70s, whether things like The Flintstones and The Jetsons or uh, like Scooby-Doo, just through, like, re-airing on TV and Cartoon Network and stuff, just remained relevant and, uh, like, like and, and, and were watched by just subsequent generations. I, I think what you're talking about, a lot of that comes down to just re-airing on TV a lot. Because there's things like classic movies. But, I mean, like, classic movies are the things that, like, you know, if they're, if they're a big hit, like, you know, there was, there was a big gap between Star Wars movies, but... The Star Wars trilogy was just such a famous, popular thing that people just kept watching them and talking about them. Um, I mean, there was the big gap between, like, the Star Trek show ending and then, you know, the Star Trek movies being made. But, um, I don't know. Sound off in the comments if you have more thoughts about this. I'm just, I'm just rambling here. Rob Secundus says, Do you think a platform like TikTok or YouTube would be a viable place to release things like Looney Tunes animated shorts? I covered this earlier. Like I said, multiple people asked about this. Ramble Raptor says, Why do you think Mickey Mouse has managed to stay a well-known icon, but the Looney Tunes haven't been able to make that transition as successfully? I mean, I think I kind of talked about this in the video, uh, about how Disney just did a really good job just making Mickey, like, the face of the company and the symbol for what Disney was and integrating him into the parks so much as like, you know, like, like greeting people as they arrive. Um, he is the brand mascot and Warner Brothers just doesn't work the same way as Disney does. And, uh, but I would push back a little bit because I can't say this for like all the Looney Tunes, but I think Bugs Bunny is a pretty well-known icon. Like I think Bugs is probably one of the most recognizable fictional characters in the world. Matt Storm, aka Stormageddon, says, Love the new Looney Tunes video. Thank you, Matt. I gotta know, who is your favorite Looney Tune? I, I, I covered this earlier. Daffy, soft spot for Elmer Fudd. Uh, and do you have a favorite of the old shorts? Yeah, this is not an exciting answer, but my favorite has always been the Rabbit of Seville. I mean, it's, it's, it's perfect. It's, uh, you know, I, I think about it all the time. My favorite character is Taz. Couldn't tell you why, he just is. And my favorite short is actually Watts Opera Doc, a classic, one of the best. Keep up the awesome work. Thank you. Now that you bring Taz up, Taz fascinates me. The thing with Taz is, I looked this up when I was working on the video, Taz only appeared in, I think, five shorts in, like, the Golden Age. He was, like, a, a fairly late addition to the cast, and he was not one of the major characters. And then, over the decades, and especially getting into the 90s, Warner Brothers just started, like, putting him in more and more Looney Tunes stuff and featuring him more and more prominently, especially, like, in advertising. And, uh, and then, like, in the 90s, you've got, like, Taz all over, like, 
t-shirts and stuff like that. Taz gets his own cartoon, Tasmania. And it's just funny to me that the character became so popular despite just having so few cartoons. I don't know, maybe there was just a thing in the 90s where between Taz and then Venom, like from Spider-Man, America just could not get enough of uh, characters with big giant mouths full of pointy teeth and lots of saliva. I don't know, it was just a moment. Patrick W., but that's my name. Uh, among film performances where athletes play themselves, is is there one better than Kevin Garnett in Uncut Gems? I mean, Larry Bird in Space Jam. I'm, I'm kidding. I think it's gotta be Kevin Garnett. Kevin Garnett is really good in Uncut Gems. Bav, Bavi, Bavi? After watching both Space Jam movies, who is the better actor, Michael Jordan or LeBron James? Michael Jordan is just kind of inherently interesting to watch. And Space Jam 1 doesn't ask that much of him, and so, you know, so he comes off, like, fine. It is to it is within his wheelhouse. Um, he's, like, maybe a little bit stiff, but, like, that's okay. Uh, he just basically kind of has to be a straight man the whole time. LeBron is actually a better actor. Like, if you look at Trainwreck, he actually he gives a real performance. He's funny. He can, like, hit jokes and all of that stuff. But in Space Jam 2 a lot more is asked of him. He has to play, like, real dramatic emotional scenes uh, and be a real character with, like, a character arc. And I think, A, the material is terrible, and B, he is, like, pushed outside of his abilities and so comes off worse. So he gives a worse performance despite being a better actor than Michael Jordan. There's my answer. Also, since you are back to doing the desk format of the 2020 videos, do you plan to bring back the 2020 beard? Uh, unfortunately, no. Um, I think that beard was a one-time thing during this period of time when, uh, you know, I was not leaving the house or going into public. It was fun to, to experiment with and try out, but in the long run, I don't think a great big bushy beard is for me. Sorry, everyone. Tentacle Teapot says, uh, also, I was so excited to hear you mention Joe Dante's Love of Looney Tunes. He's one of my favorite directors, and Gremlins 2 is one of my favorite movies. I've always found it interesting that Dante revisited the same story idea and structure so many times across his films, that, that being humans being menaced by numerous small inhuman creatures, as seen in Gremlins, Gremlins 2, and Small Soldiers. And I wondered, have you noticed any other directors who seem to really love uh, telling and retelling stories with the same basic elements? Do you feel like that works, or does it just get stale? To me, it's like they are trying to perfect the formula, and I really love seeing all their attempts at doing so. I'm drawing a blank right now, but but there are you know definitely examples of this. I feel like this applies to so many directors, and uh, and so that like I I can't even like think of one off the top of my head. But um, as far as Joe Dante goes, you saying this makes me realize that I think a better version of Looney Tunes back in action would be one that was more in line with, like, gremlins and small soldiers, where the antagonists are all just humans. Like, I don't think you need the whole, like, spy plot with Brendan Fraser and Timothy Dalton and Steve Martin and stuff like that. Okay, here's a pitch. Here's a, here's a pitch for, a, for a, a, a different version of a movie that's 20 years old. Oh my god, it's 20 years old. Anyway, what if Looney Tunes back in action was just about, like, evil people maybe taking over Warner Brothers and then trying to, like, ruin the studio and, like, you know, just, like, cancel the Looney Tunes and, I don't know, like, like relegate them to the vault or whatever. Even the vault is a Disney thing. But, um, but, like, what if the Looney Tunes ended up playing a role like Gremlins or whatever and just, like, you know, terrorized the, uh, the awful humans. Like, I would much rather just watch them, you know, dropping anvils on people's heads and, uh, and blowing them up with dynamite than riding around in flying cars and, uh, and saving the world. Um, I don't know. That could be fun. I think I'm going backwards. Uh, so Tentacle Teapot's first question. Now that Val Kilmer films have been canonically referred to as Kilms, can we start calling Night of the Coconut a... Wilm, and hopefully not the last. You know, you totally can call Night of the Coconut a Wilm. What this reminds me of is um, Irish people pronounce the word film as film, as like a two-syllable word, and, uh, and and I'm like, I don't know what it'd be, like a, a Willems, like Willems films are, but then, yeah, but then if you combine those, it's just 
It's a Willem. I, I don't know. I don't know. You guys figure it out. Armando Marchetti says, I'm watching your Nebula class. Wish I had that when I was making short films with my Panasonic Mini DV camcorder back in the early 2000s. Yeah, I in 2007, I bought a Panasonic DVX100. And that, ooh, that was my baby. That kind of limited budget slash resources approach is something that's always missing from these kinds of master classes, and it's why I love David F. Sandberg's anarchic DIY style of homemade filmmaking. While watching, a random thing popped up in my brain. Would you ever consider making the screenplay for Night of the Coconut of available to download. I realize the previous drafts and iterations are probably not something you'd feel like sharing, but the shooting script could be interesting to read and compare to the finished movie. Uh, yeah. If people want to see that, um, I'm pretty sure we could. I've got the final script on my computer. Yeah, I could put that online. Let's do it. Not the Who's Tommy, says Patrick. If you became creative chief of Netflix tomorrow, how would you reshape it? Ooh. There's a big one. I took over Netflix. Okay. First of all, make less shit. And to be clear, I don't mean just like make less bad stuff. I just mean stop producing so much stuff. There's too much stuff. Uh, it's, it's overwhelming and too much of it is very mediocre. Uh, and, and it all blurs together. So just make less stuff. Then second of all, get rid of the binge model for releasing TV shows. Um, switch to the like weekly episodic release model. Because one of Netflix's problems is they drop an entire season of TV all together, then people binge it in a weekend. And so it's only in like the cultural conversation for a week, and then everyone moves on. And so that's why Netflix has to like produce so much shit and release it constantly. And um, but if you just release one episode of a TV show a week, then that show is able to stay in the conversation for like three months and you don't need to just have this like overwhelming amount of like shows and movies dropping constantly. Oh, oh, also with Netflix, uh, you know, put things in theaters more. Like it's stupid how they put Glass Onion in theaters for a week. So yeah, anyway, my, my big idea for Netflix is um, uh, make less bad stuff and uh, make more good stuff. Gin Soaked Boy says, Patrick, how did you get through a whole podcast about Boss Baby without mentioning Admiral Baby from The Simpsons? Um, so for those who don't know what Gin Soaked Boy is talking about, I was recently a guest on the podcast, The Worst of All Possible Worlds, discussing the film The Boss Baby. And um, so I, I just had to look up uh, what Admiral Baby is from The Simpsons. I'm a pretty intense Simpsons fan, but here's the thing. I decided years ago that my cutoff point for The Simpsons is after season eight. So that's, that's all I really need. The first eight seasons of The Simpsons, then I'm good. Um, I did watch it. I did continue to like watch the show weekly, like the new episodes, I think up through season like 13 or 14. So I have seen the episode that Admiral Baby is from. Admiral Baby is from uh, Homer to the Max, I believe from season 10. My thing with The Simpsons is like in season nine, season nine has lots of good episodes, but that's where I can see the problems beginning to develop. Season nine was where the first episode that I did not like aired. Uh, and then season 10, I can really see it like kind of becoming a different show. And so I just haven't rewatched those episodes in, in a very long time, and I just forgot about Admiral Baby. Sorry. Sambo is person says, this is completely out of nowhere, but I've been struck with the question, what are your thoughts on Pink Floyd? I, I've never really been into Pink Floyd. To be fair, I never, at no point in my life did I ever get stoned and listen to Dark Side of the Moon. Um, so, yeah, just, just of the big rock bands from that era, they were never one that I was really into. Have you seen The Wall? You know, I have not seen The Wall. At some point, I should watch, like, a bunch of those Alan Parker movies I haven't seen. I don't know. Maybe maybe I'll watch The Wall, and then Pink Floyd will click for me. Um, oh, actually, two more music questions. What is your favorite Prince song? That's hard. Right now, I'm going to say Mountains off of the album Parade. Uh, and what is a vinyl you recommend? I'm going to assume you're talking about Prince vinyls. Otherwise, I, I would just say, I don't know, just buy your favorite album on vinyl. But if you have a, like a, a vinyl collection, I think everyone is like required to own a copy of Purple Rain. It's not an exciting answer, but uh, you know, everyone needs to have Purple Rain. Elliot Gammons says, so I just went to see Crouching Tiger, Hidden Dragon. Also, I am pissed that I missed the theatrical re-release. It just, I was excited about it, and then I 
didn't even realize when it happened, then I suddenly, it was gone. Ugh, one of my favorite movies ever. And something annoying I noticed was that people in the audience kept laughing at things that weren't exactly supposed to be funny, most noticeably every time the characters would fly. I can understand thinking that the effect looks a little goofy, I think that's part of the fun of it personally, but do you think audiences are more inclined to laugh at a film as if they're above it more today than they were in the past? So I've seen this brought up on on Twitter before uh, with you know people complaining about like especially like younger people like uh, laughing at slightly dated things at screenings of older movies. I personally, and this is just anecdotal, I have not really witnessed this myself. I've heard of it happening. But I, I haven't really encountered it, so I can't really say. Again, I, I've seen people complaining about it, like, happening more these days. But not having seen it myself, I'm, I can't judge and I can't really say. So I, I'm not going to throw things around like, oh, you know, Gen Z is so irony poisoned. They, uh, they laugh at anything that seems like a little odd to them or a little old-fashioned. I'm not going to say that because, again... This hasn't really been my experience, but uh, I don't know. Everyone, share your own experiences. What do you think? HXR says, if you were going to write and direct a movie that fits into one of the categories you've discussed in the video, such as Time Loop, Gonzo Blockbuster, Baseball, Music Biopic, uh, uh, Music Biopic would count, but you've already discussed the Oasis movie you want to make, which would it be and what would it be about? I mean, a Gonzo Blockbuster would really be, like, the best thing because... The thing with Gonzo Blockbusters is it's like, oh, you have tons and tons of money and you can just go absolutely crazy, you know, throwing in all the wildest shit you can think of. So yeah, I don't even know what it would be, but uh, I'm going to say Gonzo Blockbusters because it seems like the most fun. Just being like, concept artist, design the craziest shit in the world. And then we'll, we'll make it for real and put it in a movie. Death Ray Tech says, What is a thing you bought in the last year that instantly made your life easier? Okay, I'm going to cheat a little bit because I got this in fall of 2021, but it's still relevant. This audio recorder that I'm recording on right now, the Zoom F6. I, we are recording audio right now in a 32-bit float audio, which means that I don't have to adjust audio levels. It's like recording at all at all levels simultaneously. In editing, I can just lower the gain and everything sounds good. Not having to worry about the audio peaking or blowing out the mic and just not having to touch the audio levels knob has been such a game changer for me when shooting stuff. And especially when it comes to like asking like a friend to, to run audio on set, it makes everything so much easier. There are other uh, audio recorders that do this, but... The Zoom F6, I love so much. I wish I'd bought it earlier. Um, absolutely worth the like kind of hefty price tag because uh, it's it's so good. Hayuzin says, I find that some of my favorite movies and shows tend to be made by a single writer or director. Things like The Last Jedi or Knives Out from Ryan Johnson and Mr. Robot, which had most episodes written and directed by Sam Esmail. Uh, despite knowing that many people still work on those pieces of media, seeing the same name for writer and director feels more personal and interesting. Do you think in general having the same person in those roles makes for a more interesting movie? Is there a writer you wish would direct more, or a director you wish would write more? Obviously, so many of the best movies ever made uh, are from separate writers and directors. Many have multiple writers on them. And so there is no rule about this. The thing is, if you have a solo writer-director, obviously it does tend to be more of like one complete vision because that person usually conceived the idea and then saw it through to the very end, which is also a hard thing to do. Is there a writer you wish would direct more? You know, I'd like to see Tony Gilroy direct more stuff. Uh, you know, after Andor, I imagine he might have an easier time getting projects made. And so I'm excited to see, like, what movies he makes after that. Um, and a director I wish would write more. I mean, look, with The Fablemans, Spielberg had his first screenplay credit in 21 years. Uh, and he doesn't do it very often. And when he does, it's kind of a big deal. And so, yeah, I'm always happy to see more Spielberg screenplay credits. The Duke of Tumwater says, who are your top three favorite journeyman directors? Th th I, honestly, I, I don't have an answer for that. I think that gets too complicated in like defining like who exactly is a journeyman director. And then, then you'll get arguments about like, 
oh no, they do actually have kind of a distinct style. That that would be its own video. I would sit here for an hour, like going through lists of directors, like trying to trying to figure it out, looking at filmographies. I can't do that off the top of my head. Sorry. The True Alec says, favorite Looney Tunes short. Covered this earlier. Uh, the Rabbit of Seville. Wyeth says, is there going to be a book club? Because this thing is a banger. I just recently read Heat 2. It is, it is so good. It is like, it's really fantastic. I, it seems weird that, you know, that Michael Mann wrote a novel sequel to a movie, <laughs> something like 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 25 years later, but um, it's fantastic. Um, if you guys want to start a book club, you're welcome to. I don't, I, I don't have time to do it. Nadia says, hi Patrick, what do you think makes a good movie commentary track? And do you have any favorite commentary tracks you'd recommend? I mean, really, it just needs to be entertaining and interesting to listen to because there's some that are just like purely funny, like people goofing off and joking around uh, that are great. Um, I remember the Kiss Kiss Bang Bang one being good. Um, and then there's those ones that are like informative, like Steven Soderbergh ones and Ridley Scott ones. Honestly, it's been a little while since I last listened to some commentary tracks. The ones with uh, Chris McQuarrie and Tom Cruise are really good, just like breaking down like all the choices they made and like editing choices. And uh, the worst commentary tracks are the ones where people just sit there and like describe like, like what is happening on screen. Uh, but usually if it's like a good group of people together, um, who were fun to listen to. I mean, that's all you really need. I do miss commentary tracks. I listened to a lot more when I was like in high school. Brock Your Socks Off says, Hi Patrick, do you have any take on the rather notable rise in prevalence of media focusing on restaurants, such as The Bear, Boiling Point, and The Menu, all in 2022? All of these have all seemed to hit a chord critically and commercially, with The Bear getting a season two, and Boiling Point getting a TV show adaptation. Does this subject matter appeal to you, or do you see it as a trend? I'm not sure I see this as a as a trend. I think this is just one of those things where, you know, sometimes you just have this weird convergence of ideas. But but also restaurants, I think, are such an like a natural place to set stories because it is such a high-pressure environment. It's like usually the, a kitchen is a confined space uh, with a lot of people working fast. They're making stuff that is going to be judged by people. There is, like, conflict happening, like, within the kitchen. It's just, like, it's a natural place to set stories. So, yeah, honestly, I'm surprised there aren't way more movies about restaurants all the time. Lewis P.S. says, Hey, Patrick, with the news of James Gunn soon to be casting the new DCU Batman and also your status as a Josh Hartnett scholar, how would you feel about Josh being cast as the new Batman, given his history of almost being cast in the role by Nolan? I mean, we talked about this a lot on We Heart Hartnett. I think Josh could do it. My take on this is that my assumption is, based on what it looks like James Gunn is doing, that they're going in a more comic booky and theatrical direction um, from what Nolan did, obviously, because the Nolan stuff was so, like, grounded. And I think Josh Hartnett would work a bit more ideally in, in like, the maybe the more grounded, like, Nolan-y take, and maybe someone, like, a, like who's, like, a, a, a little, a little bit, like, like, bigger and more theatrical an actor... Uh, will be the way they'll go with the new one that, that they cast. I think Josh could do it. I'm not sure he'd be my top choice. But look, I would I would just love to see Josh, you know, in a superhero movie. Come on. The man's a movie star. Get him in there. Robbie the Rad says, Hey Patrick, do you have a list of dream movies you hope to make in your lifetime? And if so... Has that list changed over the course of your career? I recently came across my own list I made in ninth grade and found that I am completely disinterested in most of the ideas on it. So I'm curious to hear what kind of stuff Sheflock and Wafson era Patrick wanted to make and how that might have changed. Yeah, I mean, I feel like especially when I was in high school, I really wanted to make, like, big, expensive, like, you know, sci-fi action blockbusters. Uh, basically, like, the furthest from what I had the capabilities of making at the time. And to be fair, you know, I would still like to do stuff like that, but uh, but as I've gotten older, you know, I've, I've become more interested in, like, making some movies that are, like, smaller than what I was interested in, you know, when I was a teenager. Some ideas have, rema have, have remained. Uh, 
Uh, I do have some ideas that I came up with in college that I would still like to make uh, into a movie. And then I definitely had a bunch of stupid ideas when I was in, you know, in, in high school that I'm just like, no, that was, uh, <laughs> I, I, th that I, like, I, I've evolved. Aram, Aram says, I was watching Our Flag Means Death and saw that Nacho Vigalando directed at least one episode. And then I remembered that you and Vigalando were friendly. Nacho, great guy. Um, uh, which made me think, what's Patrick's take on Taika? I am a boy kind of man. A, a, that's a, a great expression. But I am curious to hear your take on his oeuvre, or at least which one is your favorite and why. So I must admit, I have not seen Boy, which I hear is very good. Uh, my favorite Taika movie is Hunt for the Wilder People, like by far. I, 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 I love that movie. I think it's great. Um, my general take on Taika is I think he is funny and talented and I think needs to chill out a little bit. I can't fault him for this, but like in like 2017, when Thor Ragnarok came out, basically the whole world decided and told him that, uh, that he was a, uh, a hilarious genius who was also hot. And then he believed that and decided to lean into that. And look, if everyone told me that I was a hilarious hot genius, um, I would probably think I was pretty hot shit too. And, um, and yeah, and I think he's, he's a little too overexposed. I'm, little, I'm like, Taika, why are you hosting the MTV Europe Music Awards? Like, no, take some time off. Like, you know, go, go write another screenplay. Like, Thor Love and Thunder felt sloppy to me. Uh, I'm still waiting to see that, like, rugby movie he made with Michael Fassbender that still hasn't been released yet. Um, yeah, I think Taika needs to chill out a little bit, uh, and, and, and <laughs> just, you know, go, go back to, to the stuff that I think he's best at. Nick Smith says, catching up on the Taylor Redondo run of Nightwing, it's so good, has made me realize, uh, I need more Tim Drake in my life. Can you recommend any recent runs or collections? Uh, so Tim Drake, arguably the best Robin. So I've been... You know, I've, I've, I've recently gotten back to my ongoing project of reading, like, all the post-crisis Batman comics. And so I've read, like, the original Tim Drake stuff, like the introduction of the character, him becoming Robin. Uh, that's really good. I haven't read his original solo stuff. But in terms of recent Tim Drake stuff, he's currently a major part of uh, the, the Chip Zdarsky Batman run, uh, the series that's being published now. Um, but he was also, like, kind of the major central figure of the uh, the James Tynan Detective Comics run that started in 2016 and ran for several years, and that was good. So, yeah, I would check out Tynan's Detective Comics because Tim Drake is really kind of the heart of that book. Jay Couch. Jay Couch? Couch? says, hey, Patrick, with all this talk of legacy sequels, I was wondering if you could talk about CODA films. While watching The Matrix Resurrections and reading the discourse surrounding it, I couldn't help but think that this isn't a typical sequel, it's something different. It felt like a CODA on The Matrix and its sequels, and I loved it. I totally agree. I think of Resurrections as a CODA, not so much a legacy sequel. Like, it is not intended to set up like a new trilogy of movies. Yeah, as far as CODA movies, I mean, uh, Rocky Balboa would be one of those. And then the interesting one is um, the recent re-edit of The Godfather Part 3, because uh, my good buddy Francis changed the title, and it's no longer Godfather Part 3. It's now The Godfather CODA, The Death of Michael Corleone, uh, which, which reveals that he didn't even intend it to be like the third part of a trilogy, he intended it to be a coda on the story, which uh, kind of recontextualizes it, and this is uh, interesting. But yeah, we don't get a lot of movies like that, because usually if there is like a, like a Lego sequel type thing, the studio is like, we want more of these. Like, it, you can't just make one additional one. It's gotta, it's gotta like reboot the franchise and let it go on forever. Zim Man says, uh, hey there, Patrick. In one of the recent TTTO TTT videos with Emma, you mentioned the most recent video game you played was Metroid Dread. I was wondering if you are a particular fan of the Metroid series and have any thoughts on how it could be adapted, be it a film, series, live action, animated, what have you. I wouldn't say I'm a particular fan of the Metroid series. Uh, I would say I, I played and enjoyed the three Metroid Prime games on GameCube. Or did the third one come out for the Wii? 
Um, anyway, I played those three Metroid Prime games, and I liked them a lot. And then I, this is the first one I've played since then. As far as it being adapted, here's the thing. In Metroid Prime, uh, I'm sorry, but Samus is not really a character. Samus is a cool character design who basically doesn't speak, and like a lot of video game characters, especially Nintendo ones, you kind of project yourself onto this blank slate. Like, it would be cool to see the Samus suit in live action, but in general, those games are about just, like, exploring some alien world and wandering around and, like, piecing things together. And, um, no, I don't think that there's, like, much of a reason to make it into, you know, a, a movie or a TV show or anything. It's like, what is the great story there that, that, that uh that we're dying to watch. It's like, it's better to just play it. Bjorn Blankenheim says, some months ago, Armando Marchetti asked the question, what movie would you pair Night of the Coconut with for a double feature and in what order? For your personal amusement, I wanted to bring to your attention that the film Monty Python and the Holy Grail was released in Germany with the title Die Ritter der Kokosnuss. Sorry. Sorry about the mispronunciation. A literal translation would be the Knights of the Coconut, an obvious alien-aliens escalation, so I think that should be settled. Holy shit, that rules. The Knights of the Coconut. Uh, well, there you go. There's our, our double feature. Okay, and now our final questions. Uh... Uh, Michael Torres says, Hey Patrick, I was catching up on some previous talk show videos that I hadn't gotten around to yet, and was pleasantly surprised by not one but two Metal Gear Solid references. While I know you, you stated you haven't played video games with any real frequency in many years, what do you think are the larger problems with game-to-feature film adaptations? Is it trouble translating the, the narrative? Is it trouble trying to recreate an emotion as a passive observer that you originally felt as an active participant in the narrative? Is it people thinking they need to elevate the story? Is it just normal studio shenanigans that could have affected any film? Interested in your take. Okay, so the great question of video game movies and why are they so hard to make? I think this mostly comes down to the fact that the main appeal of video games, the whole like thing that the medium is built off of, is that they are interactive. You are controlling a character and dictating the choices they make, and you are thus more invested in what is happening because like you are a part of it. This character is you. And so, when games have even like the barest semblance of a narrative, you care more about it because you are involved in it. Like, the Mario story is not an interesting story, but there is a goal for this character, and you want to win, and so therefore you care about having him get to that goal. And then when you have games like, let's say, the Uncharted games, which have, like, a surprisingly pretty good story that is, like, better written than you'd expect from a game, the fact that you were also, like, controlling it and taking part in it makes it feel amazing. And so you have these big action set pieces, but you care even more and they're more exciting because you are in them. But then when you take these games and make them into a movie, you are stripping away the interactive part of them and you're just left with the narrative, which is usually not that compelling. It's like, look, you know, I see the trailer for for the Mario movie coming out, and putting aside all the debates about, like, Chris Pratt's voice, it's like, that movie looks like, honestly, the best case version of a Mario movie. Everything is there, they're even, like, driving the, the cars on Rainbow Road and stuff like that, the animation looks nice, it, everything looks like Mario stuff. But I bet when people watch that movie, they'll see Mario bouncing around on things or driving his Mario Kart, and they'll be thinking, man, I kind of wish uh, I was playing this. I kind of wish I could be controlling him bouncing on those things. Like, I didn't bother to see the Uncharted movie because I'm just like, no, I'd, I'd rather, like, play as Nathan Drake than, uh, than just watch Tom Holland pretend to be him. Like, people have talked for years about what a Zelda movie would be, but the problem there is that Link is a total blank that, again, you just project yourself on. They'd have to create an entire character from scratch because there isn't really anything there because that's how the game is designed. And so yeah, I think that's the problem with video game movies. These things are meant to be played. When they're not interactive, it just feels like it's missing something and you're left with a narrative that, uh, you know, is usually not great. So sorry, that's my take on it. And look, oh, you ask about um, a Metal Gear Solid movie. Um, 
Look, Metal Gear Solid, obviously very cinematic games. Uh, you know, Hideo Kojima, very influenced by movies. But um, I think part of the thing with those games is they're able to be like 16-hour movies that are also like... What are the things you think about when you think of, of like Metal Gear Solid games and playing them? You think about these stealth parts where like you spend so much time obsessing over it and stressing out about like, okay, how to sneak down this hallway and like hide under a box and distract a guard to sneak by them. And that's really exciting. If that's in a movie, that's just like... 15 seconds of just watching a guy, like, you know, creep around a corner and then throw a rock to distract a guard and run by. And when you're not actually playing it, it's like, it's it's so much less interesting. And so, yeah, there's stuff in Metal Gear Solid that could be great in a movie, but I think the best parts about those games would be totally lost when you're not interacting with it and controlling with it. So that's it. So yeah, that's why I'm not really anxious to see uh, a lot of video games turned into movies because... You know, I, I, I think that's <laughs> why they're usually not that interesting. Anyway, um, that is it for today. Wow, this went on for a while and I'm tired. And, uh, and I, gotta, I got some work to do. So everyone, thank you for sending in your questions. Um, and uh, we'll have another one of these out um, this month at some point uh, about the best of, of 2022 video, which, whew, uh, based on, on the reception to that so far, that's, go that's gonna be interesting. Anyway, thank you as always. Um, I'll be back soon. Good night.